Our next speaker is Heather Brenhaus from Northeastern University. Hi, thank you, and thank you uh, very much to Bea for, uh, for inviting me here. It's really, been, it's really been a pleasure. Now, what I'll be talking about today is the fact that exposure to stress early on in life, we just heard a little bit about that um, from BJ as well, exposure to stress early in life, uh, like child abuse or neglect, has been associated with the expression of several psychiatric disorders like depression, drug addiction, schizophrenia, all of which have a very strong cognitive component, component, and all of which were also mediated by, largely by the prefrontal cortex, which I'll be talking about a lot today. But the phenomenon that I'm going to be focusing on speaks to this image of a ticking time bomb in the frontal lobe, because a lot of these disorders don't appear to manifest until adolescence. They don't really manifest immediately after the stress exposure. They seem to have this latent period where they start to show up in adolescence. So we're going to be talking about really what some of the biological mechanisms are Behind those, uh, behind those delayed effects. So we looked at um, a model of early life stress in rodents. We use the maternal separation paradigm, where pups are separated from their mom and their litter mates for four hours a day, every day for the entire pre-weanling period, from postnatal day two through P20. And what happens is not only is there a stress of being separated from their mom and litter mates, but also when there's a, reuni a, a reuniting of the mom and the pups, we see some of that disorganized behavior we just saw in, uh, in, in BJ's talk where the mom is sort of all over the place and not, not very easily uh, retrieving the pups and, uh, and starting to nurse them. So after that separation occurs, we wean the animals and they grow up normally. We take them for behavioral or brain analysis at uh, the juvenile stage, uh, P25, or um, in adolescence at P40 or in adulthood. But today we'll be talking about the juvenile and adolescent time points. And so one of the behaviors we look at is um, performance on the wind shift working memory task. I'm sure a lot of you know about this, but for those who don't, I'll quickly go through the, the paradigm. What happens is a rat is placed in the middle of an eight-arm radial maze. Four of the arms are blocked. The other four arms are baited with food. And the animal is allowed to just forage for the food. And then taken out, put, in, put back in his home cage, and then put back in the maze, now with all, four, uh, all the arms open. But now the animal has to remember where he's already been and where the food is no longer available, and now which uh, arms were previously blocked, and now he can go and retrieve his food reward. And so these animals learn this task fairly well, and once they've been trained on the task, we start to introduce a delay between that phase one and phase two. We introduce either a delay of five minutes, 30 minutes, or three hours. Okay, so this is just a general uh, task looking at working memory. And so what we find when we look in adolescence, these animals that were exposed to maternal separation, once we actually introduce that long three-hour delay, we start seeing a deficit in working memory uh, performance in these maternally separated animals. Okay, So we're seeing working memory deficits that speak to these deficits um, after early life stress in the clinical population. Now when we look in the animal's brains, the prefrontal cortex specifically, we were interested in a group of inhibitory interneurons in the prefrontal cortex that express the protein parvalbumin. Now, these interneurons are uh, largely affected in diseases like schizophrenia, and there's a large body of evidence showing that these cells are also um, critical for cognitive function specifically. And if we look at these animals, the maternally separated animals do show a deficit of parvalbumin positive neurons in the prefrontal cortex. What I really want you to look at here is the fact that when we looked in juveniles, when we looked, again, these animals were, again, separated during the pre period, then we look at them as juveniles just a few days later, and we don't see these parvovumin deficits yet. We don't see them occur until adolescence. So this is starting to speak to that latent period I was telling you about, how some of these things don't appear to manifest until, until adolescence. So we thought this was pretty interesting. This was all done in males, however, so I just want to quickly show you some of our emerging data that we're starting to collect uh, looking at sex differences. And the, the story gets a little bit more murky when we look at females, because we're not really seeing that nice distinction between maternally separated and control animals when we look at females like we do in the males. So we're obviously following up on this. I'm not even going to start to tell you that we're thinking this is a measure of resilience at all. It just means that the story is a little bit more murky than we thought. And part of that murkiness might come from the, the age at which we assess behavior. Because if we look at another behavior, 
social interaction, we start seeing something really interesting in terms of the trajectory of these deficits uh, between males and females. If we look at social interaction and specifically just the latency to first contact, we put these animals together with a conspecific in an open field and we just track all sorts of behaviors. And when you look at the latency for the animal to make contact with a conspecific, the females show um, a behavioral difference in, in juvenility when they're juveniles and they start to, they have a longer latency to contact the conspecific. And then when we look at them as adolescents, we're not seeing this, um, this effect. In males, we see that, that um, latent period in juvenile and, and when they're juveniles and we see them show a deficit in social interaction in adolescents. So again, this is starting to speak to the fact that maybe there's something about differential de um, development in, in circuitry between males and females that are starting to interact with early life stress and cause these effects to happen at different points in development, which might speak to different times of, uh, of intervention that are needed between, between males and females. So that's some of the differences we've seen um, in, based on sex. But we're going to go back to males now because, again, looking at that phenomenon I told you about latent, uh, the latency of effects of early life stress until adolescence, we wanted to get in and actually look at the biological mechanisms behind this and see if we can intervene and actually um, use something um, biological to actually prevent these deficits from occurring in adolescence. And we turn to neuroinflammation. And the reason for that is that Early life stress, we know in the clinical population, is associated with general medical inflammatory disorders like diabetes, like heart disease, like um, ulcers, right? So we know that early life stress provokes general inflammatory type of, um, of disorders in, in the body. We also know that neuroinflammation is highly correlated with cognitive deficits. We see that in Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative disorders. And what's more, clinically we're starting to see in the psychiatric population that the level to which someone has ex been exposed to childhood adversity seems to drive a correlation between inflammatory markers and psychiatric pre presentation. So basically, there is some interaction between early life stress and inflammation that leads to psychi psychiatric disease. So this is um, starting to yield a pretty interesting story. And we went back to our animals and we looked for a marker of neuroinflammation in the brains of these animals. We looked at a molecule called cyclooxygenase 2, or COX-2. I'll talk uh, again in a minute a little bit more about what this molecule does, but in general, it's a marker of neuroinflammation. And again, we see that animals that were exposed to maternal separation do show an increase of COX-2 in their prefrontal cortex, but not until adolescence. We don't really see a significant effect when they're juvenile. So even the neuroinflammatory effects of early life stress appear to start to be manifesting during adolescence. Now, what is COX-2 and what am I talking about when I talk about this molecule? So COX-2 is everywhere in the body. It's, a, it's an inflammatory molecule everywhere in the body. When you talk about it in neurons, <clears throat> excuse me, the COX-2 pathway, when it is turned on by cytokine activation, it yields an internal pathway that basically winds up causing the release of excitatory molecules that can affect NMDA receptors. And so the COX-2 pathway has been, um, uh, has been proposed to yield excitotoxic damage and excitotoxicity. So this might be a mechanism behind some of these neural uh, dysfunctions and neural deficits that we see. So what happens if we block COX-2? It's actually very easy to block COX-2 because there's COX-2 inhibitors in our local drugstore. COX-2 inhibitors are ibuprofen. Many of the anti-inflammatories we take are COX-2 inhibitors, right? COX-2 inhibitors actually in the brain are already known uh, to be at least slightly neuroprotective, and COX-2 inhibitors are even used right now as adjuvant therapy for schizophrenia. So this idea isn't entirely new, except that the problem is COX-2 inhibitors in psychiatric disease are, you know, have very variable success. And what I'm submitting to you today is that I think that might be because these neuroinflammatory effects might be earlier in development. They might be a more developmental event and maybe getting to them too late when symptoms have already started to uh, manifest might be you know, just too late to, to start treatment. So we're looking at early development to see if this is actually a, a developmental type of a, type of a process. So again, we put our animals through their typical maternal separation paradigm. And then we treated them systemically with a COX-2 inhibitor in late adolescent, I'm sorry, uh, pre to early adolescent period from P30 to P38. So a systemic injection of a COX-2 inhibitor. And then we took them in adolescence for uh, behavior and brain analyses. 
So lo and behold, when we block COX-2 in these animals, we see that vehicle-treated animals who are exposed to maternal separation do show deficits in working memory. I'm sorry, there should be a, an error um, thing on the, on the y-axis right there. So that the y-axis shows the number of errors in the wind shift task. And the vehicle-treated animals do show a deficit that we normally see. But the COX-2 inhibitor-treated animals seem to look just like control. They seem to be protected in terms of their working memory, uh, their working memory performance. And what's more, when we look at parvalbumin levels in these animals, again, we see the typical deficit that we saw before in maternally separated animals. Again, this, these are in adolescents, right, exposed to early life stress. But then we look at the COX-2 inhibitor-treated animals, and their parvalbumin levels are like controls. They seem to be protected. So there really seems to be some inflammatory component in these deficits we're seeing in adolescents. Now again, these are systemic treatments, right? So we're not exactly sure what's going on, so we want to actually go into the brain and really see if we can block neuroinflammation specifically. And so instead of blocking COX-2, we blocked actually the cytokine activity in the brain by introducing an anti-inflammatory cytokine right into the ventricles, ICV. And when we do that, we didn't look at behavior in, that, in these animals, but when we do that, we actually still do see a protection of these parvalbumin neurons in the PFC of maternally separated animals. So this is just further evidence that neuroinflammation is at play here. Now, I don't know if you, I, wanna go, I, I don't want to go too far back, but if you remember, I told you about how COX-2 is involved in this, um, in this pathway that yields effects on NMDA receptors. So the next thing I want to show you is that when we're talking about the mechanism behind these neuroinflammatory effects on uh, parvalbumin loss, we looked directly at the glutamatergic receptors. And what we see is that if you just look at the hash bars first, maternally separated animals, again, in adolescents, maternally separated animals have an increase of expression of a particular subunit of the NMDA receptor called the NR2A receptor. Uh, this isn't, I don't, I'm not showing it here, but the um, a subunit that is expressed in all NMDA receptors was not changed. So we're thinking that there's not a specific change in NMDA receptors per se, but an increase in this expression of this particular subunit. So it's a change in the, um, in the makeup of these NMDA receptors. And so maternally separated animals do show an overexpression of NR2A, but when we treated them with IL-10, this anti-inflammatory cytokine, we were able to prevent that dysfunction, um, uh, if you will, of NMDA receptors. And so I wish I could tell you that this was specific to parvalbumin neurons, because that would fit so nicely with my hypothesis that uh, parvalbumin neurons specifically are affected. But actually, we saw an increase of NR2A in, uh, in both parvalbumin positive and uh, parvalbumin negative neurons in the prefrontal cortex. But this is starting to get at the idea that somehow early life stress leads to this early developmental change in neuroinflammation and subsequently glutamatergic and parvalbumin dysfunction that might lead to these behavioral deficits. Now, of course, this is leading us to a lot of emerging questions, really, all surrounding how is this going on, right? How is early life stress translating to these changes that first manifest in adolescence? And so what's probably going to tell us um, a lot about these answers is a lot of what we're talking about um, today and tomorrow about the developing connectivity between uh, cortical regions with prefrontal, prefrontal cortex regions, really how these, um, this growing innervation is actually interacting with developing neuroimmune interaction, what's the typical development of just generally, uh, general immunity. We don't really know very much about the lifespan changes of just general immunity and inter interaction of the immune system with the brain. So the idea is what's the interaction between that during development, how is the connectivity changing, and how are these all interacting um, with stress? And then, of course, going back to the sex differences, we're going to have to really understand how sex differences between um, changes in circuitry and changes in uh, neuroimmune uh, function can affect these behaviors and how these, they're all derailed by early life stress exposure. So some conclusions of what I already showed you is that early life stress does appear to lead to social interaction deficits and working memory deficits seemingly in a sex-dependent manner, okay? And these behavioral effects appear to be correlated with parvalbumin loss in the prefrontal cortex and glutamate receptor expression changes in the prefrontal cortex. And 
most importantly, I think, is that the, these cognitive and neural consequences of early life stress appear to be able to be prevented with anti-inflammatory treatments. So I, I assume I have time to do some acknowledgments. Great. So I just want to thank uh, NARSAD and the SHINE Initiative, uh, which I got funding for in uh, my former laboratory at McLean, directed by Sue Anderson. Um, and that was, that's where a lot of the work was done. Some of the more recent work was done uh, by my lab at Northeast University, by uh, my tech, Freedom Holland, and some great undergraduates. So thank you very much for your questions.